and welcome to our second video in unit four. We are continuing on with the second derivative test. We have the same learning objectives. We're going to do a little bit of review, um, but with this, this time we're going to use the same exact graph, but this time I want you to identify concave up and concave down. And just remember, concave up and concave down, we can link to our smile and our frown. So our concave up would be a smile and I hope you mirror with your hands because kinesthetic movement and kinesthetic learning is our number one way of learning. So concave up and concave down. And please make sure you recognize what I'm doing with my hands because you're gonna have to do the same hand signals in class. So concave up is a smile, concave down is a frown. So I can actually look at my graph as I come along and I can see is it a fr frown or is it a smile? And I look at it. So I match my hand to it and look at that. I see that there is a frown all the way until negative two and there is a smile from negative two onward. And that matches the information I have. So I could identify those intervals, but before I identify those intervals, I have to identify this new vocabulary for us today. At that point, at negative two, when it changes concavity, that's called a point of inflection. So again, a point of inflection is where a graph changes concavity, where I go from a frown to a smile or a smile to a frown, concave up to concave down. So the big things that we're going to be identifying with that second derivative test, we can still identify some critical points, but it's going to be more related to the first derivative. We still can identify first and set or maxes and mins and extrema, but the big two things that we're learning are intervals of concavity and those points of inflection. So for our new vocabulary, we have points of inflection, which I told you before in the previous two slides was that this is where concavity changed. Why does this say possible points of inflection? Because you're actually going to do points of inflections twice. The first time, it's like identifying a critical value. So I'm hoping you recognize possible points of inflections as a totally separate word, PPOI. It's like the critical value. You identify them first. Then the true point of inflection is when you test it and you know that it changes concavity. So there's two different, way, two different ways we see it. In the first derivative test, we call them critical values and we identify true maxes and mins. In the second derivative test, we call them PPOIs and then we identify true points of inflection. Our other vocabulary is concavity. Again, this is our smile, this is our frown. Um, technically, the definition of concavity would be as x increases, y increases, that would be, oh, sorry, that's the definition of increasing, decreasing. What am I thinking? Um, concavity has to do with the increasing, decreasing of your slopes. That's what that is. But the easiest way to realize it would be a concave up is a smile and concave down is a frown. It is literally the easiest definition. So how do we do this? It's as simple as last time. You take the second derivative. You identify possible points of inflection, which there's three different ways you can see this. You can look at your original function and identify concavity. You can look at the first derivative and see if the slope is zero or undefined, or you can identify the second derivative and set it equal to zero. Then we use the sign chart to analyze whether it's concave up or concave down, or you use a graph. And if it is concave up, that f prime is increasing or f double prime is greater than zero, concave down, f prime is decreasing, f double prime is less than zero. And I'll show you all what that means in just a second. And then of course you identify true points of inflection. There is no difference between above and below and below and above the way there was with maxes and mins. It just matters that you cross that x axis on your second derivative. So here I have the original function, x cubed plus six x squared minus 15 x. The same example we used in the first derivative test. Now. Where is it concave up? We've already identified it's uh, from negative infinity to negative two and then concave, sorry, concave down. Concave up was from negative infinity to positive infinity. So there we have those two concavities. We also know we have that point of inflection right there at negative two. And finally, I wanna actually show you the visual relationship. So here we have the function, the first derivative, and now you have the second derivative. So look at that, I go from a cubic to a quadratic to a linear, knocking them down that peg because we're taking that derivative. So here's that point of inflection at negative two, but what's happening on the first derivative? Look at that, there's a min right there. And if there's a min right there, there's a zero on my second derivative. So again, possible point of inflection on my function is where the concavity actually changes. On my first derivative, it's a, slope of zero or undefined. So it's a max or a min. It's not even undefined. It's literally only a max or a min. And then the second derivative, it has to be equal to zero. It has to hit that x-axis. It has to be f double prime equaling zero. But now let's look at our concavity. 
So here we had concave down. And how does that relate on the first derivative? Well, you might say, okay, it's going to be below the x-axis. Well, you're one derivative off. If it's the first derivative, actually look at it. It's decreasing. So now we get to the second derivative where we are below the x-axis. Now let's look at uh, concave up. Concave up on my function, increasing on my derivative above the x-axis on my first derivative. So if we look at that all together, here's a good visualization of what's happening when we relate ff prime and f double prime. I superimpose the original function and the second derivative to kind of give you an idea of what's happening. So here you can see that point of inflection, and it's a zero point on the second derivative, concave down below the x-axis, concave up above the x-axis. Now let's look at all three. That's the same information I just told you. Now let's look at all three. Point of inflection, second derivative, it's a zero point. First derivative, it's a max or a min. Concave down, second derivative is below the x-axis, so first derivative must be decreasing. Concave up, second derivative is above the x-axis, so the first derivative should have been increasing. So this is that same information I'm going to show you, but really quick, I forgot to talk about that point of inflection in terms of what's happening with the others. So remember, on the derivative, you have a horizontal tangent line that's, a, that's occurring. That means your slope is zero. That means there is a min or a max. And then on f double prime, you are literally crossing the x-axis. That is a zero point. That is a root. It is where f double prime equals zero. So again, same information I've been showing y'all. Now let's actually do an example. So for this, we're going to do three things. We're going to identify where it's concave up, concave down, and the points of inflections. So here's my actual graph. I'm going to start by identifying where the interval is concave up. That's what it asks me to do. But I'm lying to you because I don't want to start where the interval is concave up. I want to start by rereading the question. This is so important when we talk about FF prime, F double prime, because the number one misconception kids have is failing to reread the question and thinking the graph is what just making an assumption about the graph. You can't make an assumption about the graph. You have to identify what it is. So I reread. I'm given the graph of F double prime. So I relate all my information back to what F double prime says. So. If I know f double prime and I'm relating it to f, then I know that its zeros are the points of inflection. I know if it's below, I'm concave down, and I know if I'm above, then I'm concave up. That's why we reread the question, to identify what we have and how it relates to where we're going. So we are looking for concave up. That means if we have the graph of f double prime, we're looking for where it is above the x-axis. So here's my x-axis. Where is it above? It's above from negative 3 to negative 1 and from 2 to infinity. And I know I can use infinity because the domain shows me that right there. The next question asks me concave down. f double prime is my graph, so we're looking for below the x-axis. So that interval is from negative infinity to negative 3, negative 1, to 2. And finally, it wants to know where the points of inflection are and to justify. So my points of inflection are going to be where f double prime equals 0. So that's going to be at x equals negative 3, negative 1, and at 2. And my justification is that's where f double prime equals 0. That is my justification. So here I have a second example the same style questions, and I'm hoping you go through them on your own. I have the, the answers coming up in just a moment, so take a moment, pause, and see if you can answer these three questions. Okay, so here's our answer for the first one, second, and third. Moving on. Now I have another example. We're given the graph of f prime, and we're going to be asked, I think, nine questions about it, but the first thing I'm going to do for this question when we're identifying critical values, is not to identify the critical values, but to reread the question because I have to know what I have. I know I have f prime. So that means I have to treat it that way and react all the different ways. So I know if I have f prime, I know a lot of information about f. I know a lot of information about f double prime as well. So where would be my critical values? These would be where f prime equals zero or where f prime is undefined. Looking at my graph, I don't see any undefined points, so I don't have to worry about that. So all I have to worry about is my x values where f prime equals zero, which means where are my roots? Where does it cross the x-axis? And it crosses at negative 13. 
negative 2, 4, 10, and 14. And I can check my own work because I put in my answers. And look at that, negative 13, negative 2, 4, 10, and 14. And again, that's because those were my literal roots right here, right here, right here, right here, and right here. My next question asks where the function is increasing. So again, I have the derivative. So the derivative's relationship to the function for increasing is that the derivative has to be above the x-axis. So where is it above? It's above the x-axis right here. It's above the x-axis right here as well and right there. So what are those three intervals? Those intervals are from negative 14 to negative 13, from negative 2 to 4, and from 10 to 14. My third question asks me where my function is decreasing. And so again, if my function was increasing, that was above the x-axis. If my function is decreasing, it's going to be where my derivative is below the x-axis. So there's one interval, and there's two intervals, and there's my third interval. And let's check. Negative 13 to negative 2, 4 to 10, and 14 to 16. Awesome. Now we're asked to find the relative max on uh, the, I'm guessing, the original function. So identify the relative max. I don't know. Is that going to be the for the function or? Yeah. So the relative max of the original function. So a relative max would occur around a critical point, and we've already identified those, and it would be where I go from above to below. So would this be an above to below point? Absolutely. What about right here? No, that goes from below to above. What about right here? Very good. Here, no. Here, yes. So the only points I identified were negative 13, 4, and 14 because that's where the derivative, this graph, goes from above to below, from positive to negative. Okay, now minimums, of course, those would be my opposites, from below to above, from below to above. So at negative 2 and at 10. Now it's asking us to figure out where the function would have been concave up. So this would be around a possible point of inflection, and this would be where my derivative is concave up, is increasing. So I'm decreasing, 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 but look at this. I hit an increasing point right here. That is the first interval, first point where we actually have concave up. So from negative 5, we're still increasing all the way until 1. So that would be my first interval of concave up. Now we're decreasing, 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 decreasing. But look at this, we start increasing again. So from six and a half, we are increasing, still increasing, all the way until 12. And so those are my concave up points because this is where the derivative is increasing. Now we're looking for concave down. Same exact thing. Where is it decreasing? Well, my first interval is from negative 14 until negative 5. We knew that because we already did the opposite. Then we're increasing. So my second interval starts from 1 and goes all the way to 6.5. Then we're increasing. So my third interval starts from 12 and goes all the way until 16. It finally asked me where my actual points of inflection are occurring. And there was two different ways we could have seen this. We could look at the graph or if we were creating that sign chart to figure out where it was increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing. Then all we have to do is look for where it changes from increasing to decreasing or, in, or decreasing to increasing, a change in concavity, basically. So it goes from decreasing to increasing the first time at negative 5. So that would be our first point of inflection. Then it goes from increasing to decreasing at 1. So that would be our second point. Ah, well this answer is incorrect because in order for a point of inflection to change from positive to negative and negative to positive, you actually have to be looking at the second derivative. We're not looking at the second derivative, we're looking at the first derivative. So our answers would actually be at negative 5, at 1, at six and a half and at 12. Those would be our increase, our changes of inflection. Those would be our points of inflection. Finally, write the equation of the tangent line to the graph of f of x at x equals seven. Well, what do I need to write a tangent line equation? I need x, I need y, and I need m. If this is the graph of f prime of x, then I have information about slope and I have information about the independent variable. But look here, they gave me even more information. My x is 7, they even gave me my y of 4. All I have to do is find m, and I can find that using the graph itself. So I truck along to where x equals 7, which is right here. Right? Okay.
which is right about here, and I figure out what the slope would be at that point. And I'm guessing that they were trying to use the um, tangent slope, the horizontal tangent slope right there, which would be a slope of zero. Otherwise, on an AP exam, if they ever gave you something where you had to estimate the slope from a graph, from a curve, they would almost always draw the tangent line or have it in a way where you could have easily drawn that tangent line. So probably my slope was zero. So then we fill that in to our y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So if this is zero, this is all going to disappear. This becomes y minus 4 equals zero. So then y equals 4 is my tangent line and let's check that look at that it sure is I have a table here which I'm hoping you take a uh, take a second to look through and to really read it to understand what it's saying it's kind of hard to read these tables at first but eventually you realize if you have a table they're our best friends we love them so our first question is to find the local max the local min and if there's an absolute max and an absolute min. So what do I need for that? I need the information about the first derivative, which is this second row right here. So I look for a critical point, which would be right here, right here, right here. And I look whether it's going from below to above or above to below. So in this interval, my derivative is negative. So that means we're below the x-axis. Then we hit a zero. Then we go to negative again. So we're still below the x-axis. So negative to negative, there's no min identified there. But here I go from a negative to a positive. So there is a, oh, I lied, negative to positive. That's a min right there. I was thinking of a, Oh, I was thinking of a min. So we do have one min at x equals 2. And what does this tell us? It tells us there is no max. There is no local or absolute on this example. And what is this the local min or the absolute min? So for that, you would either need to plot this kind of graph out, kind of sketch it for yourself, or identify if there were any other mins. Well, there are no other mins, so this is probably my absolute minimum. What's my next question? Now we need to find points of inflection. So again, points of inflection would occur where f double prime equals zero. So here's my f double prime in my third row, and right here it's undefined, so that can't be it. It's zero and it's undefined. So the only point of inflection occurs at one. So x equals one would be my point of inflection because this is where f double prime equals zero. Then we sketch it. Now this is the part where we kind of struggle a little bit, but we're gonna take it Oops, not a laser pointer. We're just going to take it chunk by chunk, bit by bit. So the first thing I'm going to do is identify my intervals. My intervals are at 0 and at 1, at 2, and at 3. So that's really all I need to worry about. Now at 1, my f is equal to 0, 1. So we'll put that right there. We'll say this is a 1. This is negative 1. And then my 1, 0. Oh, I read that back. Yeah, 1, 0. And then 2 is at negative 1. Okay. So I've got those three points that were given to me for the from the first row, just given to me right there. It tells me that my function is positive, negative, positive. And so now I look at my first derivative. My first derivative is undefined at this point. Okay, so those are my, it's an end point. Makes sense that it's undefined. At two, undefined could mean a couple things. It could mean that there's a min there or a max there or something funky is happening. Then I check what my derivative is doing. My derivative is negative between zero and one. Okay, well, if it's negative, that means that it was decreasing. So if this graph is in the positive, but decreasing, it probably goes down. But how does it go down? Is it concave up or is it concave down? So we look at the second derivative tells me it's positive, so that means it's going to be concave up. So I look at my concave up, look at my smile, and I figure out where we have a decreasing, and that would look like this. So I would draw that in, just like that. 
and you would do every single interval the exact same way. So I'm hoping you can actually try to finish this graph and show it to me in class. I got a couple of release problems. Again, I'll do all of the release problems together in a single video, and that should be my third video. And some closure, what do we do? We take the derivative, identify critical points, use a sign chart to analyze increasing, decreasing, or the graph, find extremum points, and that's it. So I'll see y'all in class.